So continuing with our review of the appendicular division of the skeleton, we'll now look at the bones belonging to the pelvic girdle. So the pelvic girdle has three major functions. The first is to attach the lower limbs to the axial skeleton. The second is to transmit the weight of the upper body to those lower limbs. And then third is that the pelvic girdle also supports and cradles the pelvic organs. So the pelvic girdle is formed from the sacrum and the paired coxal bones, which are called the hip bones. And each hip bone unites with the other hip bone anteriorly by way of the pubic symphysis. And each hip bone also makes contract, contact with the sacrum posteriorly. So looking at a coxal bone or a hip bone from the lateral side, we see that each of the large and irregularly shaped coxal bones consists of three regions. We have the ilium, which forms the superior aspect of each coxal or hip bone, the ischium, uh, which is highlighted in this purple region right here, which forms the inferior and posterior aspect of each coxal bone. And then finally, we have the pubis, which forms the inferior and anterior uh, portion of the coxal bone. Uh, the pubis is highlighted in uh, red in this diagram here. So these regions were initially three separate bones in the fetal skeleton. In the adult skeleton, they are all fused together into one single piece of bone, and therefore it allows the hip bone to behave as a single solid structure. At the point where the three bones are fused together, you'll notice this deep socket that's called the acetabulum. The acetabulum is where the head of the femur connects to the hip bone and it forms the hip joint. We also see this large foramen called the obturator foramen at the junction, uh, mostly between the uh, ischium and the pubis here. And there are a few blood vessels and nerves that pass through this foramen uh, to the pelvic cavity or even uh, down to the thigh through that foramen. So turning our attention to the ilium, there are four structures from the lab list to take note of. Uh, the first one is the iliac crest, and it is a structure that we can feel when we put our hands on our hips. So the iliac crest ends anteriorly at a point called the anterior superior iliac spine, and it ends posteriorly at a point called the posterior superior iliac spine. Uh, inferior to the posterior superior iliac spine is this very deep indentation that's called the greater sciatic notch. And this notch is where the large sciatic nerve passes by the hip bones uh, down to the thigh to innervate structures that are located within the thigh or innervate muscles that are located within the thigh. So continuing on with the ischium, we see that it contains three important structures. We have the ischial spine, which serves as a point of attachment for a ligament that joins the sacrum, uh, which we don't see in this picture because it's a lateral uh, view. Uh, we, the ligament would join the sacrum to the ischium at the ischial spine here. Uh, just inferior to that ischial spine is a smaller indentation called the lesser sciatic notch, which provides a pathway for nerves and blood vessels uh, to reach the anal and genital regions of the body. Uh, last, the inferior surface of the ischium contains a rough and thickened region that's called the ischial tuberosity, and this is the site of attachment for the hamstrings muscles that are located at the posterior side of the thigh. Uh, it's also an attachment point for a large ligament that holds the pelvis together. Uh, and uh, another important function of the ischial tuberosity is that when we are seated in a chair, the tuberosity supports our body weight. Uh, finally, turning our attention to the pubis, it forms the anterior and inferior aspect of the hip bones. Uh, when we are standing in anatomical position, the pubis is nearly horizontal, and the urinary bladder kind of rests on its superior surface here. The anterior aspect of the pubis is thickened here, and that's a region that's referred to as the pubic crest. The right and the left pubic bones are joined uh, at the midline of the body by a fibrocartilage joint called the pubic symphysis, which is a flexible joint that allows for expansion uh, of the pelvic bones or of the hip bones 
um, on the anterior side. Uh, this is particularly useful during childbirth so that uh, so that the uh, baby's head can pass through the opening in the bottom of the pelvis. So speaking of the pelvis, there are two functional regions to the pelvis or the pectoral girdle, or I'm sorry, the pelvic girdle. The false pelvis, which is highlighted in pink in this diagram on the left, and the true pelvis, which is highlighted in blue in this diagram on the right here. The false pelvis represents a ridge of continuous uh, bone that runs from the pubic crest on the uh, anterior side all the way to the sacral promontory on the posterior side. And its function is to support the abdominal visceral organ, so it's essentially behaving as a, a, a cup-like piece of bone or a bowl-shaped piece of bone that is cradling and holding those abdominal visceral organs. The true pelvis, on the other hand, is not a physical piece of bone structure, but rather it is a it is a passageway through the pelvis itself. Uh, the true pelvis is a deep bowl-like structure that extends through the center of the pelvic girdle, and it's an important structure uh, for obstetricians as the shape and the size of the true pelvis are important in childbirth. So there are important anatomical difference, but differences between the male pelvis, which is on the left there in this diagram, and the female pelvis, uh, which is on the right. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of those differences now. So really in the female pelvis, what we're going to see is we're going to see we're going to see an anatomy that maximizes the size of the true pelvis to aid in childbearing. Uh, the female pelvis on the left there, uh, in particular, the false pelvis, that is the, the bowl-like portion of the pelvis, and the ilium are more laterally uh, flared out, uh, which helps to create a wider true pelvis in the center of it. Uh, whereas in males, the false pelvis and the ilium are more vertically oriented, which creates a narrower true pelvis. Uh, in the female pelvis, we see that the true pelvis is wider and more circular in shape. We also see that the sacrum tends to be tilted more posteriorly, um, allowing a much greater uh, area uh, in the center of the pelvis where the true pelvis is located. Whereas in the male pelvis on the right here, we see that the sacrum tends to be tilted forward, and the true pelvis that is the opening between these pelvic bones here is much more narrow, and it's less oval or circular in shape. Instead, it's more shaped like uh, an anatomical heart. Uh, and last, we see kind of returning to the anterior view of the female pelvis on the left and the male pelvis on the right there. We see that a wider false pelvis also creates a wider pubic arch so that there's this kind of very elongated U-shaped structure uh, underneath where the two pubic bones are joined. That's called the pubic arch. And in the female pelvis, because the false pelvis is wider, it also creates a wider pubic arch, generally greater than about 90 degrees or so. Whereas if we turn our attention to the male pelvis on the right here, we see that the much narrower, much more vertical false pelvis creates a much more narrow pubic arch. And we see that the pubic arch in males is generally much less than 90 degrees.